Hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about Leopold and Loeb, the thrill of the perfect crime. And as always, this video is based on an article provided to us by our stable of attractive and handsome writers slash researchers, this one being Radu Alexander. Links to their socials can be found below, but let's get to it. And soon this involves murder... You know, viewer discretion is advised, although it does have a very satisfying ending because the two murderers in question were very stupid. So coffee's at the ready. The perfect crime is a favourite topic among mystery writers and television showrunners who are always coming up with new and elaborate ways to commit cunning, albeit fictional, murders. It is not so much of a concern for real criminals, as far as most of them go. A perfect crime is anyone that they can get away with. There is perhaps, though, one notable exception to this. Leopold and Loeb, two well-off, educated students who killed a young boy in 1924 because they wanted to commit, in their own words, the perfect crime. It wasn't murder that excited the duo per se, but the idea of getting away with the murder, because that's where the challenge lay as far as they was concerned. A challenge that, as we all know by now, they failed at, because we're literally making a video about how much they sucked at it and how hard they failed, because Leopold and Loeb were not exactly the criminal masterminds they thought they were. Sure, they had high intellects, but the superiority they liked to flaunt in everyone's faces was all in their heads. A smart person does not necessarily equal a successful criminal, and the pathetic reality is that Leopold and Loeb only committed a string of petty vandalism acts, and once they moved up to actual serious crimes, they were caught almost immediately. But due to a sensational trial, nationwide media coverage, and a controversial verdict, this murder was among the select few to be heralded as the crime of the century, ensuring everlasting notoriety for Leopold and Loeb, which they no doubt very much enjoyed. Nathan Thrudenthal Leopold Jr., which is a hell of a mouthful, was born on November 19, 1904 in Chicago, Illinois. The son of Florence and Nathan Leopold Sr., his father was a German-Jewish immigrant who amassed a nice little fortune for himself by running a freight and transport company. So no expense was spared when it came to young Nathan's education. All of that money seemed to be well invested since Nathan Leopold proved to be a child prodigy, and there are numerous examples of his impressive precociousness. But a bit of skepticism is advised here since most most of the examples come from Leopold's own autobiography, and let's, let's face it, not everyone's going to admit to being a moron, especially not someone like Nathan Leopold who had a gigantic superiority complex and was a complete and utter narcissist in every sense of the word. Half a year after Leopold's birth, another wealthy Chicagoan family welcomed their new son into the world, Richard Albert Loeb, born on June 11th, 1906, to Anna Henrietta and Albert Henry Loeb. Like his future partner in crime, Richard had a privileged upbringing, as his father was not only a successful lawyer, but a senior executive at Sears. However, his dark side started manifesting from a fairly early age, as Loeb enjoyed committing petty crimes, mainly nicking shit or thievery as it's known to Americans, and he was only emboldened when he did not face any serious consequences for his actions, even when he was caught. Rich people got a rich people. A few trips to the woodshed might have saved a lot of people a lot of grief. The two men, despite growing up in the same affluent area of Chicago, didn't really have more than a casual acquaintanceship with each other for many years. This changed in 1920 when both boys were skipped a few classes and sent to the University of Chicago. Leopold was 15 years old while Loeb was 14. Both had similar backgrounds and interests, so a friendship naturally developed between the two. However, their partnership almost never got off the ground because the following year Loeb transferred to the University of Michigan. There he took to heavy drinking and card playing and his grades started slipping. The words wasted potential, no doubt quietly hovering above his head in his mind. But ultimately, Loeb barely managed to graduate from the University of Michigan a 7 becoming the youngest graduate in the school's history. In 1923, he went back to the University of Chicago to continue studying for his master's degree, and there he rekindled his friendship with Nathan Leopold, who was doing the very same thing. Eventually, the two became lovers as well as friends. They had personalities that complemented each other very well. Loeb was more outgoing, handsome, charismatic. He provided the socially awkward Leopold with the thrills and experiences that he could never accrue on his own. Meanwhile, the more intellectual Leopold taught his companion about his life's philosophies, which Loeb ultimately adopted as his own. Specifically, Leopold became fascinated with the works of Friedrich Nietzsche, particularly the concept of the Ubermensch or Superman. Put simply, a Superman was superior to all of the average 
Joes around him and was not bound by the same societal norms and ethics. As Leopold himself would write in a letter, and I quote, A Superman is, on account of certain superior qualities inherent in him, exempted from the ordinary laws which govern men. He is not liable for anything he may do. It won't surprise you to discover that Nathan Leopold considered himself to be one of these supermen due to his intellect, and wouldn't you know it, it turned out that Loeb also was a superman too. What are the odds of that? Already they had the makings of their own little Justice League, so what, do they decide to do with these little gifts that they had apparently been blessed with? They committed vandalism. Of course. Richard Loeb resumed to his life of petty crime and brought Leopold into the mix, often using sexual favours to persuade him to join in on the fun. Even so, it didn't really take that much convincing, since in their minds they were completely justified and unaccountable for their own actions. They started out by committing burglaries, stealing cars, smashing windows, but nobody seemed to give a sh**. They moved on to starting fires and once again evaded any kind of consequences. Clearly, they were the greatest criminal masterminds the world had ever seen. So it was time to up their game and carry out something that would get the whole city talking. Leopold and Lowe began endlessly obsessing over committing what they called the perfect crime, and they spent months labouring over their plan. Ultimately, they decided that they were not only going to murder someone, but they were going to make it look like a kidnapping, complete with a ransom demand and a series of complex instructions to throw investigators off their trail. First, the victim. Like, who were they going to kill? Leopold and Loeb decided they needed someone who came from a rich family so that they could pay the ransom, and ideally someone who trusted them because it would make kidnapping go that much smoother. Initially, they even thought about targeting a member of their own families until deciding against it because targeting someone so close to them might arouse suspicion. Criminal geniuses, everyone. Ultimately, they left the identity of their victim to chance. They knew that they would kidnap a boy from their neighbourhood who came from a rich family and went to one of the local schools, but did not know who it would be until the day of the crime itself. As an aside here, uh, American film producer Armand Deutsch has always claimed later in his life that he had been the intended target that day, but a dentist appointment saved his life since the family chauffeur picked him up and drove him to the dentist's office. On May 21st, 1924, it was time for Leopold and Loeb to set their plan in motion. They spent most of the afternoon driving a rental car around the Kenwood area of Chicago, looking for their victim. They spotted several potential targets and rejected them all for various arbitrary reasons. At around 5 o'clock, they were ready to call it quits for the day when the perfect opportunity presented itself to them, in the form of the 14-year-old Bobby Franks walking home alone from school. The circumstances seemed perfect. Bobby was alone, his family was rich enough to pay the ransom, and he knew Richard Loeb, so his guard was down when the car quietly and silently pulled up alongside him. Loeb and Leopold offered to give Bobby a ride, and the moment the young boy was in the car and shut the door, his fate was sealed. You see, beforehand Loeb and Leopold had discussed it and decided that they should commit the killing as quickly as possible. So, when Bobby Franks looked out of a window unsuspectingly, he was hit in the head with a chisel. His killer struck him several times without hesitation and without mercy, but Bobby still held on. The blows caused multiple gashes that splurted blood everywhere inside the car. The killer decided to switch tactics, so he forced a piece of cloth down Bobby's throat, keeping his mouth shut until the young boy suffocated and all signs of life had left his body. The deed was done, although you may have noticed that we didn't say exactly who did it, and that's because both Loeb and Leopold maintained to their dying day that it was them who was driving and the other is the one who committed the killing. And spoilers, that's the one part of their story they were able to remain consistent on. Bobby Franks was dead, but that was just the first step of their plan. Now came part two, getting rid of the body. The killers had their dump site already picked, a marshy culvert near Wolf Lake, about 25 miles out of the city. It was an area that Nathan Leopold knew quite well, as he often visited to do a spot of bird watching. They drove around town until it was dark, even stopping for a hot dog at one point, despite having a dead body in the back seat. Already the arrogance of the two killers was evident, as in their minds, nothing could possibly go wrong. Spoilers, it did. When night came, the duo took a remote dirt road to Wolf Lake. They stripped Bobby Franks naked and dumped his body into the culvert. Afterwards, they went to Loeb's house, disposing of the murder weapons somewhere along the way. At home, they burned all their bloodstained clothes and then got to work cleaning the rental car. At the Franks house, Bobby's parents, Jacob and Flora, had begun to panic when their son did not show up for dinner. None of his friends or siblings knew where he was, and a search of his school already revealed that he had not trapped himself inside or anything like that. So Jacob Franks called a friend of his, a lawyer named Samuel Ettelson, for assistance. While the two of them were out, Flora Franks received a chilling phone call from a man claiming to be George Johnson, who told her that her son had been kidnapped and to expect instructions in the morning. In reality, this was Leopold and Loeb enacting the third part of their so-called master plan. 
the kidnapping. They thought that adding this component to their crime would not only increase the thrill, but obscure their true motives from the police, not to mention giving them a little extra spending money since they intended to collect the ransom, like idiots. They made the initial call while returning from Wolf Lake, at which point they also mailed the ransom note which arrived at the Franks' house the following morning. And as far as ransom notes go, this one was fairly boilerplate. It told them not to contact the authorities, have $10,000 in small unmarked bills ready, and to await further instructions, and if all this was done, Bobby Franks would be returned unharmed. Little did the parents know that their son was already dead. While Jacob Franks was getting the money, Samuel Ettelson alerted the Chicago PD that Bobby Franks had been kidnapped. This was all supposed to be hush-hush, but a journalist found out about it, probably after being tipped off by a source inside the police department itself. Like any good news hound, he was up to date with all the goings on in the city, and he'd also heard about the body of a boy that had been recently found near Wolf Lake that was being treated as a possible drowning victim. He may have been the very first person to connect the dots between the two events, and he told the police, who then told Jacob Franks. Franks reacted exactly like you'd expect a heartbroken father to react. It couldn't be Bobby, he said. The description of the body did not match him. It wouldn't make any sense for the kidnappers to kill him. These were all justifications of a desperate man who was clinging on to the hope that his son was still alive. But while Jacob Franks waited to receive a new call from the kidnapper, his brother-in-law went to view the body. At around 1pm the following day, George Johnson found again. Samuel Ettelson answered the call and the kidnapper gave him the following instructions. Get in a cab that would arrive shortly and go to a certain drugstore where you'd receive another call. Ettelson then passed the phone to Jacob Franks, who received the same instructions. However, in all the excitement, both men immediately forgot the address of the drugstore, so when the taxi arrived, neither one knew exactly where to go, and neither did the cabbie. Not that it would matter, because right before leaving, Jacob Franks received another phone call. This one wasn't from the kidnapper. It was much worse than that. It was from his brother-in-law, who called to tell him that the dead boy found near Wolf Lake was indeed his son. Leopold and Loeb were starting to realise at this point that this whole murder business wasn't as easy as they'd assumed it was. The killing was far more violent and chaotic than they'd expected, the kidnapping didn't go anywhere because the body was discovered almost immediately, and as you will soon find out, the disposal was the worst decision of all, and the one thing that would ultimately sink the two of the alleged criminal masterminds. And it's worth pointing out as well in the original article I'm reading from, like, master criminals is put in big air quotes, which I very much appreciate. Unsurprisingly, the murder of a young boy from an affluent neighbourhood became the biggest topic of discussion in Chicago, and the state's attorney, Robert Crow, took personal charge of the investigation, smelling a nice big promotion at the end of it. The first lead came from the ransom note. Investigators determined that it had been written on an Underwood typewriter by an intelligent and well-educated man. This would have been the perfect occasion to try and lead the authorities astray by fudging the English a bit and making it sound like the kidnapper was an ordinary criminal. But Leopold and Loeb's egos would not have allowed that. They could never refuse the opportunity to show off their intellects, even when it was against their own interests. So of course, Leopold typed the ransom note out in perfect English, using long, fancy words that proudly showed off his higher education and legal expertise. What a moron. That was Leopold's folly, but Loeb was no better. He was so arrogant and confident that he thought it would be fun to investigate his own crime with some of his fraternity brothers, including a reporter for the Daily News. Everyone knew about the failed kidnapping plot, so the 19-year-old Loeb and a few other students tried to track down the drugstore where Jacob Franks was supposed to go to see if they could find any clues. At one point, the reporter even asked Loeb if he knew the victim, to which Loeb smiled and said, and I quote, if I were going to murder anybody, I would murder just such a cocky little son of a b as Bobby Franks. Criminal masterminds, everybody. It's like they, they couldn't help themselves. Leopold and Loeb were just two egomaniacs who couldn't resist the temptation to show off how superior they thought they were to everybody else and insert themselves into the investigation. They thought they were so distinct and special, and it's almost amusing how cliche they really were. On the other side of the law, the police already had Nathan Leopold's name, since he had been spotted around Wolf Lake several times by the game warden. Yeah, don't dump a body somewhere that you frequent, you you idiot! They interviewed him, but because he was an established ornithologist, he did have a valid reason to go to Wolf Lake on bird watching expeditions. Uh, plus, he came from a rich and respected family, and no one thought that someone like him would commit such a, a heinous and violent crime. Not yet, anyway. The police bought Leopold's story for the time being, but eight days after the murder, they caught their biggest break in the case. Next to Bobby Frank's body, they found a pair of glasses, which had fallen out of Leopold's pocket while carrying the body. The prescription was very common, so it wasn't exactly a passport photo, so the police didn't think anything would come of it, but when they checked them out, anyway, they hit pay dirt. Specifically, the hinges of the glasses were very distinct, and only one place in all of Chicago supplied them. They only sold three pairs. One of them was 
to Nathan Leopold. So it was time to take off the kid gloves, but the police still didn't want Leopold to think they suspected him. They even booked him a room at a fancy hotel for their interview, so they could have a little discretion, away from the prying eyes of the press. What Leopold did not know, though, is that Richard Loeb was being interviewed in literally the room next door. For the most part, the two of them stuck to the same story. They spent most of their day driving around town in Leopold's car, eating, drinking, and birdwatching. At night, they engaged in some birdwatching of an altogether different kind, and picked up two girls and drove around some more, and ended the night by driving to Leopold's aunt and uncle's home. Which initially sounded fairly reasonable to investigators, and with the gift of hindsight, very well rehearsed. The problem was, though, is that Loeb and Leopold didn't do anything to to actually corroborate this. So when the investigators realised that the majority of their alibi hinged on the fact they'd done a lot of driving, they thought, well, let's go ask the family chauffeur. And when asked, he said he'd worked on Nathan Leopold's car all day long. And just like that, the entire alibi crumbled. When presented with the facts, Loeb was the first to crack, and he told the police everything just 10 days after the would-be perfect crime occurred. He ended his confession with an attempt to pass the blame onto Leopold, saying in part, I just want to say that I offer no excuse, but I am fully convinced that neither the idea nor the act would have occurred to me if it had not been for the suggestion and stimulus of Leopold. Furthermore, I do not believe that I would have been capable of killing Franks. Suffice to say that the arrest and trial of Leopold and Lowe caused a bit of a palaver. Shoutouts to the author for using one of my favourite archaic words, becoming one of the first few examples to be referred to as the trial of the century in papers. The families of Leopold and Lowe hired one of the best lawyers in the country, Clarence Darrow, the man who would defend teacher John Scopes in the Scopes Monkey Trial a year later. Leopold and Loeb had already pleaded guilty on Darrow's recommendation. This way, the trial turned into a sentencing hearing, and the lawyer only had to argue in front of a judge instead of a jury, who'd be more likely to side against the two young men who openly admitted to murdering a child. His one goal then was to prevent his clients from having a date with the hangman's noose, and he did this by bringing in several psychiatrists, or alienists as they were called back then, to testify on the mental state of the accused. He also brought up their age, admissions of guilt, neglect, and even sexual abuse Leopold may have suffered at the hands of his governess when he was a kid. Basically, he was just throwing at a wall, see what would stick, to create some kind of mitigating circumstances for Leopold and Loeb. Darrow ended the hearing with a two-hour-long speech variously described as masterful and the finest of his career, which I will now reproduce for you in its entirety. No, it was a, a plea for mercy, basically, an attack on the capital punishment itself, and an argument that the sentence should be reformatory, not retributory. Whatever he said, it persuaded the judge who sentenced Leopold and Loeb to life in prison for murder plus 99 years for the kidnapping. And that was the end of the criminal careers of Leopold and Loeb. The two of them stayed friends on the inside and even started a school for prisoners in 1932 at Statesville Penitentiary. However, Loeb was killed in 1936 by his cellmate, James E. Day, who cut him with a straight razor over 60 times, possibly after Loeb propositioned him for sex. Nathan Leopold was actually paroled in 1958 after 33 years in prison. Seemingly a reformed man, he no longer thought himself as a superman or ubermensch, instead calling himself a humble little person. He moved to Puerto Rico in search of obscurity, where he continued studying birds. He got his master's degree, found a job, and he even married. He died of a heart attack in 1971. So thank you for tuning into this episode of Biographics. As mentioned at the start, I've been your host, Carl Smallwood. Yes, that is my real name. And this video is based on an original article provided to us by Radu Alexander. Links to all of our socials can be found below. As always, if you'd like this video, leave a like. If you've got something to say about it, leave a comment. In particular, I would like feedback on my hosting and presentation style. I'm trying to strike a balance between the altogether more formal and let's admit better presentation style of my esteemed predecessor Simon Whistler and my own more casual, relaxed style, which you can see on my own channels, Fact Theme with Cal Smallwood and Wiki Weekends. So let me have any feedback about that and I'll try and like deal with it and respond to it as best as I'm able to. Otherwise, if you want to see more videos like this, uh, subscribe for more and as always, have the day you all deserve. Cheers. <laughs>